Well, welcome back, everyone, to A Little Faith. I am so happy today to be joined with Jason Hensley, who is going to be talking to us today about his recent book that he has just published called One Family. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Mike. Nice to be here. You know, I should say not welcome back, but, you know, you've been sort of a, a stalwart on this podcast for many times. So we're happy to have you, you know, almost as a recurring guest uh, ongoing. And I'm sure, you know, as you just alluded to offline, you know, there might be another book coming out. And so we may have to uh, have you back on again. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> Thanks. So I wanted to kind of start with the context of the book and why you decided to write One Family. Uh, so tell our listeners a little bit about kind of the background of why you decided to write this book. So One Family is interesting. I decided to write it because I was struck at sort of the connection that I had had to the Jews growing up. I had I had always been taught about the hope of Israel and always been taught that the land of Israel was an important place because that's what was promised to Abraham and it's connected to the fulfillment of the promises. So that I had always had sort of the schema that had a very important place for the Jews within it. And it really struck me in going to university and talking to people and realizing that that schema was incredibly unique that that was something that not a lot of Christians had. And it, it was it was really weird in working through Jewish history and realizing that, in fact, the majority of persecutions against Jews were connected to Christianity. So it wasn't just that I had this unique perspective, but it was that the majority of Christianity throughout history had actually had the opposite perspective. <laughs> and that... That really kind of blew me away. So I started thinking when I was when I was doing my PhD in Holocaust studies that it would be really good to put together material to explain why did I think this was the Christian approach? Like why why did I think that the Bible really advocates recognizing God's special relationship with the Jews and such? So that's what I ended up doing. I, I mentioned it, I think, on uh, A Little Faith when I was talking to Levi about the book Bible in Context, that I, that I put together a, an initial dissertation and I did it before my committee had approved it. And that, that actually is this. <laughs> so so I, uh, I had originally put this together as my dissertation. It didn't didn't get approved because they didn't have a methodology. So that's what Bible in Context is. That was the methodology that I put together. And that's why that came out first and, and then this. So so I just always had this kind of sitting on my computer that I put together because this didn't end up being my dissertation. I had I had to do something a little more focused on the Gospel of John. But I I felt like this still had a, a very strong perspective and an important perspective. I just didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And then when October 7th happened and Israel was attacked by Hamas, I, I sort of watched what was going on there. And in the, the few days afterward, probably a few weeks afterward, um, I'm, I am involved with the Anti-Defamation League. And so I've, I, th what they do is they monitor anti-Semitism throughout the U.S. and the world. And it was really striking to see how anti-Semitism went up. At the time that I was putting the book together, it had gone up by 381% wow. uh, year after year. So it was, it was like crazy, it, the explosion. And it's still up at, at high levels like that. Mm -hmm. so, so I really felt like, okay, I have this just put together sitting on my computer right now is the time. This is the time that Christians need to be grounded back to this is where we came from. This is, this is the roots of our religion. So that, that really was what pushed me. It was, it was October 7th and then seeing the aftermath of it in, uh, in North America. Yeah. It's interesting when you, we talk about, you know, how, 
maybe a lot of Christians don't understand how similar Christianity and Judaism are and those common ties between what those communities have. And it's interesting, you know, when I was, I mean, I think I understood some of it um, prior to reading your book, but it's interesting to see kind of how and why the two communities suddenly split. And as you kind of alluded to, some is kind of hard for us to know because we can't really go back in time without, you know, a lot of, you know, details um, document wise that we kind of have to sort of make an educated guess, I think. Um, but obviously we do know throughout history that there obviously was a clear tie in divergence. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a fascinating topic to just kind of work through and see how and when the groups really started to started to break out. And, and all scholars have their own opinions. I tend to, as I mentioned in the book, I tend to think that, that 70 CE when Jerusalem was destroyed, that that was kind of the big, the big point at which every, every group connected to Judaism, including Christianity had to make a choice as to what are they going to do about this? How are they going to, how are they going to function in a post temple world? And so you can see that, that Judaism ends up transforming into rabbinic Judaism. That's the direction that they choose. And then Christianity ends up going a totally separate route. And, and that's, I think, where that divergence really happens. So you, you kind of lay out in this book a very clear way um, what it would be like to be a Jewish believer who would be living in the first century. Now, I know you could probably go into lots of details on this, but for lay out for our listeners, some of the elements that you discovered in your book and talk a little bit about like the groups that you talk about, like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Sanhedrin. And obviously, you know, a lot of this, you know, we would see, um, we'll call them characters that we see, um, you know, in the New Testament. So this was one of the most exciting parts for me, I think, because as, as you said, we see these people in the New Testament, but they just kind of like appear. And I think that when we grow up reading the Bible, we can just be used to the fact that they're there and we don't ever ask ourselves, who actually are these people? Like, where did, where did they come from? And why does the Bible not explain who they are? I, I, I think the, the answer to that, why the Bible doesn't explain it, is just because everybody knew, right? It, it wasn't like, you know, back then at the time when the, when the books were written, it wasn't like somebody was going to pick up, pick up the Bible and say, what? Like a Pharisee? I've never heard of those people before. So, so we we sort of have the, uh, the, unfortunate downside of of not living back then that makes it a little bit a little bit difficult so i really wanted to put together that that historical context for the readers thus i ended up talking about the pharisees the sadducees and the essenes and then looking at like so so with those three major groups then who are the elders that you hear about and who are the scribes what's the sanhedrin and just kind of putting together that that picture of here's what it would have looked like to live in a first century Jewish world. And I think largely what you get is the Pharisees were, were mostly like the lay people and a lot of people followed what, what they taught, but the Sadducees were largely the priests. So it was this really interesting dynamic of the Pharisees had all of these extra teachings, which they called the oral Torah. And they taught those to the people and most of the people followed them. And then if you wanted to worship, that's when you had to get involved with the Sadducees because they were the ones in control of the temple. And I think that this is really fascinating to see just because I, I don't know if you ever had this, this feeling, but like, I always read them like they were the same mm -hmm. when you're, when you're reading the Bible, it's like, oh, it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and not realizing that, that for the most part, they kind of actually like hated each other. And they, and they never really like did stuff together aside from the fact that they both recognized that the temple was important, but it was just, it was really helpful to, to see that, that those were both considered part of Judaism, even though they were so divergent. And then you had the Essenes that, that like were totally on the outside and they, on purpose, like they decided to be on the outside. They're the Dead Sea Scroll people, probably. And, uh, 
And they just like hated the temple, ab- absolutely despised it. They had all kinds of, you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can read all this stuff about like how the temple's going to be destroyed and how it's this place of wickedness. And like, uh, I think it's fascinating because there's, there's similar parallels to like some of the stuff that Jesus says about the destruction of the temple. So I, I find that helpful because it really, it places a lot of diversity in first century Judaism. And to me that, that just opens up this door for Christianity to, to be able to come in and say, well, yeah, there's this diversity and we fit within that diversity. Like it, it was sort of like back then you were Jewish. If you said we're a Jewish group, you know, and, and we have roots to ancient Judaism, that, that was it. It wasn't, it wasn't like you had to have a specific set of beliefs or even a specific way of doing things. Like all three of these groups did stuff way differently. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it. Cause like you mentioned, you know, when we read the new Testament, uh, you know, it's almost like, okay, we've got Jesus and his followers. And then we've got like, they're the good guys. And we had the bad guys. They're the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we just sort of lump them all together. So it's interesting to look at, you know, maybe why they would say certain things. And, and it's interesting that, you know, you, you are, you're right that they, they almost despised each other and the diversity that you have uh, within this group. You know, you, you really outlined the relationship between Jesus and Judaism. And it's, it's right to remind all of us that Jesus, you know, especially when we come at it from what we'll say, like a Christian perspective, that Jesus was, you know, he, he was Jewish. He taught from a Jewish perspective. He was raised in a Jewish household. He taught from a Jewish perspective. You know, many of his teachings, you know, we, you can link everything back a lot to Old Testament writings. But why do we, why do you think that that's important for us to have an understanding of when we're reading the New Testament? So, okay. So that's an interesting question because I think there's a lot of just background that we really miss when, when we don't have these pieces in place. So for instance, um, I, I felt like I always knew that the, the old Testament mattered. Um, and it, it struck me going to seminary that, that a lot of people didn't. <laughs> so that, that was one, um, like we, we do the daily readings and we, we read the old Testament regularly, but it was interesting just to see that a number of people often spend a lot more time in the new Testament. Uh, so that, so that intrigued me as far as like my classmates go and whatnot when I was, when I was in seminary. And I think a lot of that stems from not a, a lack of recognition that Jesus is Jewish. Cause I think like every Christian, I, I shouldn't say every, but for the most part, like if you were to go up and ask them and say, Hey, was Jesus Jewish? They would probably say yes. Right. That that's, that's been put together. And a, a lot of people recognize that, but I think for most people, including Christadelphians, if you were to go through and say, okay, so Jesus was Jewish, how do you think that affected his uh, early life? How did that affect as he was growing up? They would probably say, I don't know, you know, or something like that. Or they might say, well, he went to the temple when he was 12. So we have, we sort of have like these little pieces, but the thought of like, oh, wait a minute, like that probably means that morning and evening, Jesus recited the Shema because that's what Jews do. You know, the hero Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. You'll love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Like he would have recited that every morning and evening. Like that to me really explains when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? It explains why he says, love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like it, it really gives a background to that. Now I'm not, I'm not saying that Jesus didn't think that that was the most important, but but that there was also this background of he said it every morning and every evening. So, so it almost just like rolls off the tongue and it, it, it just, it really is connected to what he did all the time. So you have like pieces like that, where I think that, um, that his Judaism would have really affected his life that we just don't think about a lot. So that's, that's a small example of it. The other thing that I think is really key is that it also allows us to better understand groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the way that he treats them. 
And that's the key thing to me. So for instance, when he comes in and he says, you all are a bunch of hypocrites. Like if I were to just walk into some random church and say that to everybody, (laughs) right? That wouldn't go over very well. Like they'd be like, who even are you? Like, what is going on? And why are you saying that? But if I went to my Ecclesia and I said that to everybody, there's, it, it makes a lot more sense because I know who they are and I understand here's what you all believe. Here's what you're doing. And so to see Jesus doing that when he, a lot of the, a lot of the teachings, and this is something else that a lot of people don't realize a lot of his teachings parallel with the Pharisee Hillel. There's a, a, they're not all the same, but like a lot of the things that he says match up with one of the major Pharisaic teachers named Hillel. And so essentially what he's doing is he places himself in this Pharisee camp. I'm not saying he was a Pharisee, but like he was there talking with them about the things that they always talked about. He understood their teachings. He was discussing all of this. And therefore, that's why he could say, you all are a bunch of hypocrites, because he's there, part of that group. And that's why the Gospels consistently, it's like five or six times, refer to him as rabbi. That, that was a Pharisaic term, right? Like that's what the Pharisees were, were called. They were the one, like the, the uh, Sadducees, they weren't called rabbi. So it was, it was specifically the Pharisees. And uh, so I think you can just, you can kind of place him within that, that field. And a lot, of his, a lot of his criticisms make a lot more sense. Like he wasn't just saying, you all are bad people. I can't believe how terrible you are. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm here interacting with this movement and I'm noticing there's some problems, right? Like we got we to gotta fix this. And that's interesting. I never really thought about it that like, like you said, like if you walked into a random church or synagogue today and said, you know, you're all a bunch of hypocrites that you don't know them and they don't know you. And Jesus would have known these people. Like we don't have too many names of who the Pharisees, the Sadducees or who's on the Sanhedrin. There's a couple that we, we would know, but you know, he would have had working relationships and knowledge of who the individuals in these groups are and had conversations that are not recorded in scripture and probably had many conversations with each of them to understand what they believe. And they themselves would understand, you know, we have lots of teaching of Jesus, but it's interesting. We think about it from like a personal perspective that these are real people. And there's a reason that he can say this to that, those groups. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that neat? I I feel like it really, it makes a lot of the background just fit together that and and things like Nicodemus too right like we do have we do see some of those personal conversations where where he says why do you do it like this like what you don't don't you see how this all fits together and he he attempts to really bring that out but to me that it shows Jesus much more i think i think for a long time i and and maybe christianity in general had sort of seen christ as on the outside condemning the pharisees mm-hmm. but it's more like he is a reformer working on the inside that he comes in and he says, okay, here's, here's what we got to fix right? this. This isn't, this isn't good. And as a result of that, um, what's, what's strange about it is the, the Pharisees get frustrated, but it's actually the Sadducees who are involved in bringing him to Pilate and eventually his crucifixion. So I, I think that that's a really key piece because like I said, we often lump them together, but weird, weirdly enough, there's this strange transfer <laughs> from uh he's he's kind of like working within that pharisaic group and then at the end point it really becomes the sadducees who oppose him you made reference a little earlier to the destruction of the temple i want to come back to that um so you know in in your book you really outlined how the temple was very important um for a component of jewish worship in the first century so can you talk a little bit about what happened with the destruction of the temple in 70 CE and what it did for both the Jewish religious leadership at that time, but then also for the Christian believers moving forward as well. Yeah. The destruction of the temple is a really fascinating thing to ponder just because again, talking about historical context, sometimes I wonder if we can really fathom what a big deal it was and what an impact it would have had on all of these Jewish groups. So for instance, I mentioned that the Sadducees were the ones 
who were involved in the temple worship. Well, as soon as the temple is destroyed, everything's done for the Sadducees. Right? They, ha- they have no other and anything that connects them to worship. So the Sadducees just disappear. Like as, as the priests, they have no viable way of even continuing because the, the way that God had set things up, they would be sustained by the offerings and the tithe. And that all just vanishes. Now, as far as the Pharisees go, this, this is actually really intriguing historically. So the historical origin of the Pharisees goes back to the Babylonian exile. And the reason it goes back to that, so, so this is like 500s BCE. The reason it goes back to that is because that was the destruction of the first temple. Right. So if you, if you kind of go back to that point and you think about it, what you had is the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and people were trying to figure out, well, what do we do? Like the, the law tells us that we're supposed to offer these offerings. It tells us that we're supposed to go to the temple three times a year for these feasts. How do we do that? Like you basically, without a temple, you can't keep the law, right? It's not, it's not possible. And so at the time when the first Babylonian or when the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, people were trying to figure out how do we, how do we do this? And that's where the Pharisees came from because they said, well, here's, here's what we call the oral Torah. These are other commandments that God has given that shift the focus of the law. So they, they basically, they make this stuff all up, right? And they, they come up with all of this, but this is like the new, the new way of worship that is supposed to work when you don't have a temple. So in other words, my, my point here is the destruction of the temple really positions the Pharisees to be the main center of Judaism after the destruction. So that the Essenes, they disappear because they just get killed by the Romans. There's not a lot of them. So they get all destroyed. The Sadducees are, are gone because they don't have a temple. And the Pharisees say, hey, this is why we were created, right? Like we, we were ready for this time when there was no temple. Christians, on the other hand, they point to things like the Olivet Prophecy, or they look at uh, references to the destruction of Jerusalem or to the, the, like the day of the Lord kind of thing in the writings of Paul. And they say, well, you know, we, we've been predicting this. When Christ carried his cross, he said, the days were coming when they'll say to the hills, cover us, to the mountains, fall on us. Um, because if they do these things in a, in a green tree, what will they do in the dry? So like he, he quotes this reference to destruction that's going to happen in 70 CE. So Christians say, well, we've been expecting this. And the, and the point is, is that God is showing that the law no longer is functional. And so that's the Christian interpretation that God makes this, this judgment against the law and finally says the law's done. So what's weird about it is the Pharisees come along and they say, okay, we have to figure out what do you do about the law? And their interpretation is, well, you come up with new provisions so that the law now is, is a bigger deal. So that's, that's why the Sabbath has become like this really big thing within Judaism today, because it, it's sort of replaced the temple. And then uh, uh, Christians went the other way and said, well, see, this is, this is proof that God doesn't want the law anymore. So that you can really see the divergent mindset that develops at that, at that point. And it's interesting. You think about how, like, we, when we started earlier, we talked about, you know, how, how did these two groups split and what is it? And you know, you've kind of laid out, you believe that it's really that temple, that it's just the destruction and, and how that happens. And now, you know, we see through history, you know, what that historical event has done for both groups. And now, you know, 2000 some odd years later, what the, what, how those two groups look so different. And where their focus is on, as you said, you know, now the Sabbath and then versus the Christianity who doesn't really focus too much on the law. You know, Jason, I want to thank you so much for your time today and also, you know, really kind of digging into this book. You know, before we finish, you know, anyone who, well, first, anyone who wanted to read this book, where is the best place for them to go and get a copy of it? So it sort of depends on how they want to read it. Um, <laughs> the, book, the book is available at the Christadelphian Library. So in North America, you can, you can get it there. CB&L agents have it in Australia. It, uh, I don't think I have it available in, in England yet. 
So you'd have to go through Amazon there. So if you want to get it through a Christophian distributor, uh, there's a few that have it. And then otherwise you can go to Amazon. The interesting thing you'll find if you go on Amazon is uh, it, it has it as Kindle as paperback and this is new and as audible with an AI reader. So we'll, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how that goes over. Um, it was, it was one of those things I got an email from Amazon saying, Hey, do you want to try this? And I said, okay. And then within an hour, like it had, it had, you know, quote, read my book. <laughs> so it was, it was really it's very interesting. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see if anybody's into the audible piece. And then finally, you know, for anyone who does have the opportunity to read the book, and I would suggest doing so because it is very enlightening. What do you hope is their biggest takeaway of this book? So for me, it was incredibly powerful to see Jesus within Judaism and also to recognize that Jesus and Paul seem to expect Christians to continue to see themselves as one family with Jews. Now, I, I want to clarify that. I don't, I don't mean like one family as in, uh, as in everything is wonderful. Like we recognize, look, we, we, we totally believe different stuff. And, and so we disagree on some major things, but you can still disagree in a family and that's, and that's okay. But I, I hope that what we can do is, is acknowledge that, that we're all connected and that that's not something that we should forget that like as Bible readers, anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism should be one of the furthest things from our minds. And that when we see this kind of stuff, just like how Christ mourned over Jerusalem, when we see anti-Semitism, we, sh it should upset us. You know, we shouldn't just be like, oh, well, that's what happens. Like this is, this is a big deal. And, and if, if somebody says something to us and we think, whoa, that's anti-Semitic, we need to say, you can't say that. Like that's, that's not an okay thing to say. So I, I hope that the book really gives a biblical basis for that, for that relationship and for that willingness to stand up and say, you know, actually, uh, I, I support the idea of Jews having a homeland, right? I, I think that's a biblical concept. And I, I think God promised the land. I think, I think that's good. And being, being willing to do that. Uh, be, because of the biblical basis. So I, I hope that, uh, that people take that out of it and that it inspires them to really recognize the connections between biblical Christians and Judaism. Well, again, thank you so much for your time today, Jason, and I hope everyone uh, has the opportunity to take a read of this book. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Mike.